Well, thank you. It's a great, uh, great pleasure to be here today. And um, I have never spent any time on the Vanderbilt campus, and I've certainly enjoyed my, uh, my brief visit. Um, I think when most people think of the Civil War, uh, politics is not the first thing they probably think of. You think of uh, military engagements, battles, blood and gore, and that sort of thing. I'm not going to shed a drop of blood today, except rhetorically, and there'll be plenty of rhetorical blood shed. Uh, but certainly the Civil War is not simply a military event. I think the Civil War was a political crisis, a political crisis not only in its origins, but in its course. Uh, we certainly think of the Civil War as a culmination of a political crisis, the conflict over slavery, the sectional controversy, and then the secession crisis leading to war. But I think you can also argue that the Civil War itself is a crisis, a political crisis in and of its own right. Uh, a crisis that originated in what was considerable disillusionment with political parties and anti-party rhetoric during the tumultuous 1850s. Our somewhat jaundiced and cynical view toward politics in our own time would in many ways be echoed uh, in the 1850s. I think they would uh, I think they would understand and share at least some of our uh, political values today. That disillusionment uh, with political parties and with the political process uh, was reflected on both sides during the war, both the Union and the Confederacy, uh, beginning in the secession crisis itself. Uh, William Henry Seward, who Lincoln will eventually appoint as his Secretary of State, and others talked of building a broad-based union coalition at the beginning of the war and to move against a kind of narrow partisanship, particularly to build a broad-based coalition in support of the northern war effort. The radical Republican faction, the radical faction in the Republican Party, of course, feared such a strategy. Uh, they felt that such a strategy might well mean an abandonment of party principles, and this becomes a constant theme and debate during the politics, not only of the Civil War era, but the politics of our own time. When do you stand on principle? When do you try to build some kind of bipartisan or nonpartisan coalition? Uh, those questions were certainly very important during the 1860s, and they remain so today. Abraham Lincoln himself, of course, had stood firm during the secession crisis and had refused to compromise on the question of slavery expansion into the national territories. Yet at the same time, once the war begins, he courts Stephen A. Douglas, who unfortunately for Lincoln will not live very long to rally Democrats uh, to the war effort. And certainly Lincoln himself does not hesitate to appoint generals of democratic antecedents. In fact, I think you could say during the first year of the war in the North, there was a kind of general suspension of political activity, at least as, used, as it's usually defined. The Union Party label was widely used in the fall 1861 elections, which were, if not, if not exactly nonpartisan, certainly the partisan passions, the partisan fires had been tamped down. On the other side of the Mason-Dixon line, anti-party rhetoric flourished among the Confederates as well. And what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm first going to look at the Confederates and the, and the political values of the Confederates. Uh, and then at about the halfway point, I'm going to switch to the Union side. So you'll know about when, you're, uh, when this experience will be over. It's always good as a as a person who listens to a lot of lectures, I always like to sort of know when we're uh, heading into the second half, as it were. Uh, certainly the anti-party rhetoric that had been present in the, uh, in the nation in the 1850s uh, flourished in the South as well as in the North, and it continues to flourish among the Confederates. In fact, aside from enshrining slavery in their new constitution, which was, of course, a very important part of the Confederate Constitution, the Confederate founding fathers in Montgomery, Alabama, also tried to place the drive for Southern independence within an American political tradition. Specifically, they tried to link the new Confederacy 
to memories of the American Revolution. They talked about the right of a people to revolt against tyranny. They talked about national self-determination. And in doing so, they embodied an almost 18th century distrust of political power and political parties. And I think they self-consciously tried to echo the American founding fathers, who of course were strongly anti-party, even as they were the founders of the first American party system, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. In using anti-party rhetoric, in expressing suspicion and distrust of political power, Confederates compared the Northern Congress to the British Parliament. And of course they compared Abraham Lincoln to you know who, one of the great villains of American history, terrible old tyrant George III. Confederates considered themselves to be the true defenders of a Republican form of government. One New Orleans editor even asserted the Confederates should have the best claim to the 4th of July as a national holiday. The Yankees should not be able to claim it. We have the best claim to the 4th of July, they said. Because they considered themselves the true heirs of the American founding fathers. One delegate at Montgomery even, suggest, even suggested at one point naming the whole concern the Republic of Washington. And in various pieces of Confederate stationery, George Washington was labeled with two words, both significant, a rebel, and a slaveholder. And of course he had been both. But then in this same sort of stationery, southern women in full period costume were also labeled rebels. And there were even uh, pieces of stationery that had slaves on them. And under the drawing of a slave would be the legend, one of the rebels. Confederates, of course, asserting that slaves were loyal to the Confederacy as well. Uh, a sort of delusion, of course, that is still, unfortunately, even around today uh, with some groups. But in any event, the American Revolution was a powerful historical memory for the Confederates, as, of course, it was for the Federals. And in some ways, the American Civil War became not only a military battle, but a political battle over who had the best claims to being the true heirs of the Founding Fathers. And the Confederates tried to stake out their claims very early on the seal of the Confederacy. When you win the Jefferson Davis Award, you get, you get, the, uh, you get a seal of the Confederacy done with the original stamp and the whole thing. And on the seal of the Confederacy, there, who is on horseback? None other than George Washington. The Confederates themselves proclaimed that they, in fact, were the last best hope of preserving not only the memory of the founders, but preserving liberty in a republic. There's a kind of millennial rhetoric that you can see uh, in Confederate oratory. Now there's millennial rhetoric in Union oratory as well. I mean, many people on both sides thought, okay, the Civil War here is, this is sort of the culmination of human history and many expected that Jesus would return um, at any time. As war dragged on, these historical analogies continued. Defeats became veritable valley forges of this new war. The Confederates, however, were also somewhat uneasy about their connection to the American Revolution, or at least their connection to the idea of revolution. They talked about, for example, a conservative revolution. Or at one point, Jefferson Davis said, ours is not a revolution at all. Well, of course, conservative revolution is an absolute oxymoron. I don't think there's ever actually been a conservative revolution, well, depending on how you define your terms. But anyway, that's what they called themselves. And in some ways, they were right, because the Confederates, of course, were deeply ambivalent about democracy itself. Not only as slaveholders, they were ambivalent about democracy among white people as well. Some of the Confederate founders, at least privately, wondered if white manhood suffrage had not been a mistake after all. If you let too many people vote, you have political turmoil. And again, that fit into anti-party rhetoric. Uh, 
And I think some of these politicians actually would have been more than happy uh, to retreat uh, from democracy. Uh, but they couldn't push that too far because during the war, obviously, they need political unity and they need support from the broad ranks of Southern society. And so they try to achieve this kind of harmony, Jefferson Davis and others, by talking in a kind of anti-political and specifically anti-party rhetoric. And so this new political culture is going to reflect this disillusionment with party politics. And of course, it has been noted for many years by historians that the Confederates never did develop a political party system. Maybe had the Confederacy lived longer, they would have, and some historians have speculated on that, but they, but they didn't. They didn't. They believed that political parties had betrayed the interests of Southern whites. They believed that their experiment would represent a drive for political purification. They talked about ending battles over political patronage. They talked about establishing an honest, limited kind of government though some worried that they might not be able to carry it off. Some expressed the fear that their new capital in Montgomery, Alabama would become every bit as corrupt as Washington, D.C. Of course, I've lived in Alabama long enough to note that uh, corruption does sometimes flourish in uh, uh, Montgomery, Alabama, uh, and, and probably will continue for some time. In some ways, this animus against politics and political parties was reflected in the Confederate Constitution. Now, for years, textbooks have noted, lecturers have observed, the Confederates basically plagiarized large sections of the U.S. Constitution. That statement is both true and misleading. It's true in a literal sense in that large sections of the U.S. Constitution were simply copied into the Confederate Constitution, but it's also misleading because the Confederate founders would have said yes, but what we are really trying to do is to perfect the work of the American founders by making some significant changes. And had there not been a war, they might have tried to push this uh, a bit farther. It was not simply a pale imitation of the U.S. Constitution with explicit protections for slavery thrown in, though obviously those explicit protections for slavery were important. The Confederate founders were not squeamish about the subject of slavery. They were willing to use the word in their Constitution, in political rhetoric, speeches, etc. But they also had a broader political agenda in mind as well, one that in some ways echoes debates in our own time. For example, they wanted to adopt reforms in what economists would call fiscal policy, taxation, spending, that sort of thing. The Confederate Constitution banned protective tariffs. Typically, Southern Democrats had been free traders of one kind or another, so they, they wanted a ban on protective tariffs. There would be a Confederate tariff, but it would simply be a revenue tariff, not designed to protect industry, but simply designed to raise revenue. There would be no bounties or subsidies for industry. There would be no subsidies for railroads, for building railroads or canals. And in one especially interesting innovation, the Confederate Constitution mandated that it would take a two-thirds vote in both the House and Senate to approve any expenditure that had not been requested by the President. This supposedly marked an end to what was then called log rolling to what we would today call what? Earmarks. Earmarks. And to even strengthen that, the President Jefferson Davis was given a line item veto. And the Confederates were very proud of this, of their work here. They believe, in fact, that they had significantly improved on the U.S. Constitution. They also changed the nature of the presidency. We'll never quite know how, because again, the Confederacy didn't last long enough to see how this would have played out, but Jefferson Davis had the war continued, would have been out of office in the year 1867. Why? Because he served a single six-year term, would not have been eligible 
for re-election. The idea was to reduce the importance of presidential elections. Again, this expresses a fundamental disillusionment with politics. They believed that presidential elections had been a source of corruption. Amazing, they would think that, but uh, uh, they were worried about that, and so they figured if the president was not eligible for re-election, this, uh, this might work out better. Also, the president was given the power to dismiss cabinet officials, just like a U.S. president would have, but he could only remove lower-ranking officials for cause and then subject to Senate review. This was a kind of early version of civil service reform. Because presidents in the 19th century had large and burdensome powers of appointment. If you read about Abraham Lincoln's day, for example, a Lincoln is always beset by office seekers that he has to sort of cleverly uh, fend off. If you look at the papers of any 19th century presidents, they are absolutely choked uh, with correspondence dealing with patronage. Uh, you know, I want my brother-in-law appointed to some postmastership in some crossroads village and that sort of thing. And the idea was you would end that sort of thing uh, by reducing the power of the president uh, to dismiss public officials, hoping these minor uh, patronage squabbles would be, would be tamped down. Of course, that would not quite work the way it was envisioned. In fact, even as the Confederates were drafting their Constitution, the president of the convention in Montgomery, a Georgian by the name of Howell Cobb, wrote to his wife saying that he thought about half the state of Georgia were in Montgomery seeking office, and the other half were at home writing letters <laughs> on their behalf. You know, of course, when you set up a, a new government or a new business, there will be people that flock to that seeing the opportunity for position and profit. These supposed reforms in the Confederate Constitution won widespread approval at the time. They certainly crowed about it. The Constitution was easily ratified. It was largely a pro forma measure. The secession conventions ratified it with very little, well, there was debate in South Carolina, but South Carolina is always off by itself. Now, The thing that happens next, and this is something that, that historians have, have not paid uh, too much attention to, not nearly enough attention to, is what we might call in the sort of terms of political science, political socialization. How do you socialize people into a new nation? I mean, they've grown up Americans, they've grown up citizens of particular states. How do they identify with this new Confederate states of America. Well, socialization obviously takes place in many ways through participation, voting, that sort of thing, uh, but it also begins at a very young age. We are all politically socialized at a fairly tender age by our families, by our education, and the example I'm going to cite here are the textbooks, create Confederate textbooks or suppose Confederate textbooks, often a thin veneer of nationalism. You slap a Confederate preface onto a Yankee textbook and you have a Confederate textbook. Now others go farther. Um, it's sad to say that history, for the most part, wasn't taught very much in the uh, 19th century, at least not directly. A lot of the history that was conveyed was done through geography textbooks and that sort of thing. Uh, but there are political lessons to be learned. One Confederate textbook, for example, decided to need to teach the students the meaning of the word despotism. How do you do that? You simply refer to the Lincoln administration. Another text claimed that if the rulers of the northern states had been Christian men, the war would never have occurred. So there's a kind of religious element of political culture, and of course, when you think of, of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, you know, you think of the Christian Confederate heroes, and not surprisingly, Davis, Lee, and Jackson are all portrayed in these textbooks as national heroes worthy of comparison to the American founding fathers. And in turn, the textbooks present a view of a united people fighting in a righteous cause. And just like the Confederate founders, these textbooks are not squeamish about slavery at all. They cite chapter and verse uh, to defend the institution of slavery. 
All right, so there we have it, this vision of a republic shorn of political conflict, shorn of political parties, with a glorious millennial future. Now, of course, we know what happens. That's the trouble with this. We know how the story comes out. This is not good. We, I wish we had a pill we could give people, you know, where you'd have amnesia, and so you could have people on the edge of their seats and thinking, well, how's this going to come out? Uh, the fact that the Confederacy fails, of course, has sent people ever since 1865 searching for explanations on the battlefield and off the battlefield. Uh, historians and political scientists, not to mention many Americans, have simply accepted the idea that a two-party system is somehow natural, all-American, if not divine, and largely beneficial. And therefore, the argument has been made that since the Confederates did not develop a two-party system, this was much to their disadvantage. They would not have seen it that way. And let's start at the top with the President, Jefferson Davis. The hope was that Jefferson Davis would be the Confederate George Washington, literally. He had been a consensus choice like Washington. There had supposedly been no electioneering in the Montgomery Convention to make Davis president. Well, there was no public electioneering. There was a lot of electioneering behind doors, behind closed doors, but no public electioneering. Like George Washington, where had Davis learned of his election? On his plantation? Davis's sometimes cool demeanor also seemed to resemble that of the dignified Washington. Just like Washington, Jefferson Davis could be uncomfortable and stiff on social occasions. He kind of lacked any kind of revolutionary fire. He was certainly not a, you know, a fire-breathing speaker by any stretch of the imagination. If you could find very many Americans who could quote any of the words of Jefferson Davis, I would be very, very surprised. There aren't many that are all that quotable. Oratory was not his thing. Uh, but these comparisons to Washington seem to bode well, that Davis would be the great founder of the Confederate Republic, there would be a flowering of anti-party politics, and of course Davis has two inaugurations. Uh, he's not inaugurated as the provisional Confederate president in Montgomery, but then once the Capitol moves to Richmond, he's He's inaugurated as what was called the permanent Confederate president, which is a misnomer because he wasn't the permanent president. But anyway, under the permanent Constitution, he was inaugurated on February 22, 1862. That date was not chosen at random. Now, I know we live in the era of President's Day, but I'll tell the younger people in the audience, that's Washington's birthday. We used to celebrate Washington's birthday as a holiday. We had Lincoln's birthday, Washington's birthday. So you inaugurate Davis in Richmond under a statue of George Washington on Washington's birthday. Wonderful, wonderful. Unity, heritage of the Revolutionary Fathers. But of course the same thing happened to Jefferson Davis that happened to George Washington. He becomes an immediate lightning rod for criticism. The early opposition, of course, comes from those factious South Carolinians who thought that one of their number really should have been elected president. The editor Robert Barnwell Rett and other South Carolinians were soon denouncing the men they called the pimps and parasites in Richmond. And we think our political rhetoric is harsh today. We, ours doesn't hold a candle. I've got, and I'm just getting warmed up. Congressman Lawrence Kidd of South Carolina railed Davis's supreme imbecility has well nigh undone us. You cannot find a more signal failure in history. In history. <laughs> but for sheer vituperation, and the 19th century specialized in vituperation. If you don't know what that word means, look it up. It's a great word. You'll know after I give this quotation. For vituperation, I think Davis's fellow Mississippian and old Whig rival James Lusk Alcorn easily wins the prize. He once described the President of the Confederacy as, quote, a miserable, stupid, one-eyed dyspeptic, an arrogant tyrant who now occupies his cushioned seat in Richmond, draws his $25,000 a year, and boasts of the future grandeur of the country 
which he has ruined, the soil which he has bathed in the blood of a people once free but now enslaved. Oh, let me see him damned and sunk into the lowest hell. I don't think anything worse than that has been said about George W. Bush or Barack Obama. I don't think so. I, you know, we still have time, but you know, that's pretty bad. Another Confederate firebrand, Lewis Wigfall, a native of South Carolina who is, however, a senator from Texas and would be frequently intoxicated, was often heard in various Richmond water hole, watering holes to say, Jeff Davis ought to be hung. It's pretty direct. John M. Daniel, the acerbic editor of the Richmond Examiner, described the president as serene upon the frigid heights of an infallible egotism wrapped in sublime complacency. Now the irony, of course, is many of these critics of Davis were themselves touchy egomaniacs who never realized that they shared many of their president's own character flaws. In fact, the South Carolinian James Henry Hammond, who is a fascinating study in his own right, psychologically and otherwise, uh, perceptively noted that the Confederacy was plagued by what he termed big man meism. Big man meism. That might even be said of some academic institutions and departments that, you know, egos kind of get. I think big man meism is very much among us that uh, we might even make it less sexist and make it more inclusive. Uh, so you get some flavor of the anti-Davis rhetoric that crops up very quickly. In fact, some of the central political values of the new Confederate Republic were turned against the Davis administration. Opponents warned about the supposed dangers of a dictator. Governor Joe Brown of Georgia, certainly a thorn in the flesh of Jefferson Davis, accused the president of exercising imperial power in making military appointments. Others compared Davis, not Lincoln this time, but Davis, to guess who? George III. Davis, Davis's calls of national unity were met with cries for liberty. When the government suspended the writ of habeas corpus, as was done on both sides during the war, Davis' own vice president, Alexander Stevens, denounced the man who's presumably his boss as weak, vacillating, timid, petulant, peevish, and obstinate. We better not tell Joe Biden that one, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> Alexander Stevens' beloved brother, Linton, was even worse, sputtering that the Confederacy might need a Brutus, a Brutus, against the mad, infatuated, bloated piece of incompetence and tyranny, Jefferson Davis. And just to cap it off, the often intoxicated Robert Toombs of Georgia, who had served as, in Davis's cabinet as his first Secretary of State, denounced the president as a stupid, malignant wretch, and during the spring of 1864, came very, very close to calling for armed resistance to his own government. Now, historians, like me, we cherish these colorful quotations. Some of you laughed, you stayed awake, they're effective, right? And they certainly signify opposition to the Confederate government. But at the same time, their very extremism I think, suggests the often impotent nature of that opposition. And here the absence of political parties, and this is going to be heresy among some historians, but I'm going to say it anyway, I think here the absence of political parties actually work to Davis's advantage. Because even his most rabid critics, including everybody I have quoted, refused to organize an opposition party. They railed against the president, they might warn that conscription, suspension of habeas corpus, and other government measures threaten to destroy liberty, but they never formed an effective opposition. Governors in North Carolina and Georgia often clashed with Confederate officials. After the summer of 1863 and the defeats at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, there was a growing 
peace movement in the Confederacy, but a peace movement that remained disorganized. Now certainly historians have seen opposition to the Davis administration as toxic and have argued that Confederates would have been strengthened by a party system. But Davis and the Confederate government, in fact, reaped considerable benefits from the fragmentation and disorganization of their opponents. For sure, Davis had to deal with some difficult individuals. Joe Brown, Governor Joe Brown of Georgia alone was enough to send one screaming. Zeb Vance of North Carolina, not nearly so bad an opponent, but a man who also took an often parochial view of the war. Yet it's often forgotten that Vance and Brown were the exceptions. Most of the governors, indeed most of the newspapers in the Confederacy, despite historians' penchant for always quoting the most critical ones, most of the governors and most of the newspapers supported the government and the Davis administration for most of the war. Davis got most of what he wanted from Congress. He had but one minor veto overridden during his entire administration. In fact, the Confederacy was able to do something that the sons of the Confederate veterans have forgotten about today, and that is create a government with substantial amounts of centralized authority in a nation supposedly devoted to states' rights. You have conscription, the first national draft in American history. You have suspension of habeas corpus. You have government control over large portions of the Confederate economy. And of course, Davis's defenders pointed out that like George Washington, the Confederate president had received much unfair criticism. And even at the end of the war, I think what is some ways most remarkable is how many citizens and soldiers had still not lost faith in their government and the Confederate political system itself was still functioning at least to some degree in the spring of 1865. Now the North, of course, here we go into the second half, the North begins a war with a functioning, well, depends on how you define functioning, but more or less functioning party system. Yet here, too, there were immediate calls for political unity and the abandonment of party. In fact, throughout the war, and I particularly paid attention to this a little bit more in recent years, you can find very few public defenses of two-party politics in either the North or the South. In fact, one Republican in the midst of a heated gubernatorial campaign in New York in 1862, said this, Jefferson Davis rejoices to see the formation of these parties. In other words, if you want to serve the interests of those southern traitors, you will try to continue politics as usual. There was a sense that parties and dissent perhaps had no place in wartime. Even Lincoln said at one point that people naturally divided into political parties in times of peace. But Lincoln did not specify what they should do in time of war. In fact, if you look at the political, or I guess you'd say historical lesson, the kind of script people were following, they look back to the War of 1812. In the War of 1812, New England Federalists had opposed, bitterly opposed the War of 1812 and President Madison, and in doing so, including the opposition of military appropriations, they had committed political suicide. And so Northern Democrats decide they can't go quite that far in opposition as the Federalists had during the War of 1812. I think it's also fair to say that just as the Constitution, the Confederate Constitution, somewhat helped Jefferson Davis, the U.S. Constitution certainly helped Lincoln in this political crisis. For one thing, a four-year term gives Lincoln time. One historian has speculated had the United States had a parliamentary system of government, Lincoln might have been out of office in 1862 with the war going badly. 
In fact, in the north, once you get past the first year or so of this sort of bloom of unity, anti-party, that sort of thing, a lot of the normal political process continues. Elections continue during the war. In fact, one of the things you can say about political activity in the 19th century in the United States, it was constant because of the way elections were scheduled and scattered. You had spring elections, you had fall elections, you really didn't have a national election day, so there was political agitation and voting all the time with elections scheduled throughout the year. There was little thought given to delaying or postponing elections in the North or in the South. And I think this is extraordinary how many countries continue to hold elections during civil wars. I would suggest precious few, but their elections go on in the Union, they go on in the Confederacy. For the Federals, the first big test, of course, comes in the off-year elections the fall 1862 elections. And Republicans had good reason to be nervous. The war was at a stalemate. Uh, Confederates had achieved considerable success in 1862, at least in the Eastern theater of the war, not much success in the West. The Democrats were resurgent. Democrats were railing against emancipation. They were railing against conscription. They were railing against the suspension of habeas corpus and political prisoners and all that sort of thing. The Democrats also seemed to have an advantage in the Republican Party, seemed to be increasingly fragmented and divided. Radical Republicans described Lincoln as a rather slow coach. Now, I live in Alabama and we say slow coach, we think of a football coach, but he, what they mean is a coach, you know, pulled by horses and that sort of thing. You know, Lincoln just doesn't move with the times. He's too slow. He's too slow on two things especially. Emancipation and also the course of the war itself. Uh, because the radicals believe that you have to have the death of slavery and success on the battlefield at the same time. And in fact, if you have the death of slavery, success on the battlefield will follow. By this time, too, the northern press remains as partisan as ever. Reporters with very little knowledge of military affairs are nevertheless critiquing strategy, presenting often romantic and unrealistic descriptions not only of combat, but what they see as the potential for military campaigns. There's a kind of persisting faith in amateurism just give any good red-blooded American a weapon and he can win the war. You don't need any of this West Point strategy stuff. Uh, in fact, one amateur reporter named Charles Wilkes, who actually, uh, his background was in the sporting press. They even covered cricket in those days in the United States. Richard, I want to point that out. Um, Charles Wilkes not only criticized General George B. McClellan's West Point strategy, but questioned McClellan's loyalty. By the summer of 1862, there were rumors afloat, especially among the radicals, that George B. McClellan was in fact a traitor. So the Republicans were nervous as they approached those 1862 elections, as well they might be. They were shocked by Democratic victories in the fall elections, especially the election of Horatio Seymour in New York. Now today you could probably stand outside a Walmart for months before you could find anyone coming out who could identify Horatio Seymour, but Horatio Seymour was a big name in his time. Uh, you didn't have to be a devotee of, you know, whatever their equivalent of C-SPAN 2 was to identify Horatio Seymour. I've seen all kinds of references to this gubernatorial election in the letters of common soldiers, privates and corporals, are worried about this New York election. These are guys who aren't even from New York. Because the election of Seymour was seen as symptomatic of a public souring on the war. Increasingly, the so-called peace faction of the Democratic Party now called for an armistice and peace negotiations. And the soldiers were worried. The soldiers themselves were pretty unified. A lot of them who had been Democrats back home soured on their own party 
particularly on the so-called northern copperheads who had turned against the war. They denounced these peace men, they denounced compromise, they denounced partisan politics in the same breath. And they worried, they worried about the gains that traitors might make in this election. But despite Republican setbacks in the 1862 elections, and those Republican setbacks were serious, as one congressman coming to the White House said to the President, it's not your fault we didn't all lose. It's an odd double negative, but I think he made his point. They were mad. They were mad. And there were rumors that Lincoln would renege on the Emancipation Proclamation. Harriet Beecher Stowe was absolutely convinced that you could not rely on Abraham Lincoln. He would be a backslider. But despite the elections, Lincoln stuck with the Emancipation Proclamation, even after the disastrous battle of Fredericksburg. And in some ways, the strength of Confederate resistance probably strengthened Lincoln's hand. Had the Confederates made some sort of peace overture or compromise offer late in 1862, who knows what might have happened. But they didn't. And so Lincoln will persist, and he will persist despite political opposition. Lincoln's strength is evident. His party obviously controls the presidency. They control both houses of Congress. They control the Supreme Court. And despite a war, the Republican legislative accomplishments were significant. If Davis got most of what he wanted, so did Lincoln, and even more importantly, so did his party in Congress. A higher protective tariff, the first income tax in American history, a Homestead Act that had been stymied by Southern Democrats in the 1850s, a Pacific Railroad Act to build a transcontinental railroad, a land-grant college act to create institutions like Auburn. I have to mention, have to mention Auburn because my daughter's an Auburn grad. See. Even though I'm an LSU grad teaching in Alabama and an LSU fan, I've got an Auburn daughter, I'm a Civil War expert. Okay, a little, little footnote there. Now, so significant legislative achievements, yet at the same time, and you saw the pattern already with the opposition in the Confederacy, politics as usual is going to be politics as usual. And it was at the beginning of the war. Lincoln had to create a cabinet, just like all presidents had to create a cabinet. And Americans used to handicap cabinet creations like they do football players on National Signing Day today. Lincoln appoints one of his leading political rivals, William H. Seward, as Secretary of State. And of course, Doris Kearns Goodwin made a lot of money writing a very thick book called Team of Rivals that deals with Lincoln's cabinet. Though she may have gotten it wrong, they were rivals, but how well they worked as a team, I think, is very questionable. Uh, Seward, at first, tries to take over the administration, conduct a kind of silent coup against Lincoln until Lincoln sort of puts him in his place. And the bickering in Lincoln's cabinet never really did settle down. His Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon Chase, thought he ought to be President of the United States. In fact, as one of Chase's Ohio rivals put it, Chase is a good man, but his theology is defective. He thinks there's a fourth member of the Trinity. Uh, <laughs> not a humble fellow. Um, he angles for the presidency until he's finally sort of pushed out. Lincoln has to face a terrible cabinet crisis in 1862 when the Republicans in Congress try to push out Seward. They almost got rid of both Seward and Chase. They didn't want to get rid of Chase, but Lincoln almost maneuvered that they both were out. And then in 1864, he manages to slide the radical Republican Chase and the deeply conservative Republican Montgomery Blair, his postmaster general, he manages to slide both of them out of the cabinet and avert a deeper political crisis. In fact, Davis, excuse me, Lincoln was undoubtedly 
much more adept at Jefferson Davis in dealing with cabinet problems, in dealing with patronage matters. Because Lincoln realized that despite the war, a lot of politics as usual would continue, especially in making appointments. The New York Customs House, for example, which was the most notorious seat of political corruption in the 19th century, I think that's fair to say, went on as usual. Loafing workers engaged in political activities. Or take another example, the Pennsylvania Senate race of 1863. In those days, of course, under the original Constitution, state legislatures elected U.S. Senators. Pennsylvania Republicans were in trouble in Pennsylvania. They, they were in trouble because on a joint ballot, which was how senators were elected, the House and Senate, the Confederates had a one-vote majority. So they should be able to elect a Democrat, right? So all they have to do is agree on a candidate. But the Republicans had a trick up their sleeve. They had Simon Cameron. Who was Simon Cameron? He'd been Lincoln's first Secretary of War. Why wasn't he Secretary of War any longer? Well, he had clashed with the President over policy, and he was also a notorious crook. In fact, Lincoln once asked Cameron's rival Thaddeus Stevens whether Cameron would steal. Stevens said Cameron would not steal a red-hot stove, <laughs> but presumably anything else. And Cameron got all upset about this, went to Lincoln, and said, Stevens has to apologize. And at least as the story goes, Steve, uh, Stevens said, okay, I said Cameron would not steal a red-hot stove. I take that back. <laughs> interpret, that as you, interpret that as you will. Why would the Republicans turn to this notorious wire puller and corruptionist? For good reason. They figured Cameron could certainly buy that extra vote necessary to elect the Republican to the Senate. Now, of course, the Democrats understood the same thing. In fact, Democrats in the Pennsylvania legislature started carrying arms and threatening any members who broke ranks. And in fact, all this scheming failed, and Cameron was not elected after all. But it illustrates how even in the midst of a civil war, the arguably the greatest crisis in American history, politics, as usual, continued. But with a twist. Because what you now have is what might be called a politics of loyalty. There is no question that the Lincoln administration, just like the Davis administration, though with some differences we might talk about during question and answer period, moved against dissent. There was press censorship in the North. There were newspapers that were suspended from publication from time to time. This was strongly supported by the Republican Party. Even the religious press became heavily partisan in some areas. Henry Bowen's misnamed weekly The Independent, which was the most popular religious publication of the time, was anything but independent and sometimes quite partisan. At the same time, the Northern Democrats were not a very effective political opposition. And the Peace Democrats were especially inept at hindering the war effort. The Copperheads were increasingly marginalized, and to some degree suppressed. But at the same time, the political rhetoric of the day and the political tactics became increasingly polarized. Republican governors in Illinois and Indiana, for example, suggested using troops to watch Democratic legislatures after Democrats had won in the fall of 1862. In the North, so-called Union Leagues were organized to support the war effort. These were ostensibly nonpartisan organizations to support the government and the war effort, but increasingly the radical wing of the Republican Party gained control of the Union Leagues. And patriotism is increasingly used for partisan purposes. Probably no great surprise there. In fact, the Union Leagues trumpeted shadowy talk of a Northwestern conspiracy. 
we would today call it a Midwestern conspiracy because they were refer referring to the Midwestern <laughs> part of the country, a supposed secessionist conspiracy hatched by copperheads to take the Middle West out of the Union. There were charges that Democratic newspaper editors were part of this disloyal conspiracy against the war effort. And of course, Lincoln received fire not only from the Copperheads and other Democrats, he has to fend off challenges from Salmon Chase, the radical Republican and inept General John C. Fremont, to gain renomination by his own political party in 1864. But when Lincoln does, they christen themselves the Union Party and the ticket of Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson are going to cruise to victory under the Union Party label, with some Americans even expecting that this Union Party is going to survive and the Republican Party will fade away. Democrats, of course, had hoped to prevail in 1864, but they were not only inept, they were divided. Some decided they would be too clever by half, that they needed a military man on their ticket to show that they were loyal Americans after all. And some of these more conservative Democrats sought a kind of centrist strategy with George B. McClellan as their candidate. McClellan remained popular among many soldiers in the Army of the Potomac. Democrats always claimed that McClellan was a victim of the radical Republicans in the Lincoln administration rather than a victim of his own ineptitude. But the trouble with the Democrats in 1864, they nominate a war man on a peace platform, on a platform calling for peace negotiations, a platform that their own candidate refused to endorse. Poor McClellan, poor Democrats. But I think more significantly with the heightened political excitement, you see the politics of loyalty reaching a kind of fruition, with charges of conspiracy, loose talk of tyranny on the one hand, treason on the other. And in a key campaign speech in 1864, the Secretary of State, William H. Seward, simply called the Democratic Party the allies of treason, and claimed that the Democrats' peace plank would destroy the American Republic. Given the importance of soldier voting in 1864, because some states provided that soldiers could vote in the field, or of course, since the voting takes place in October and November, you might give soldiers convenient furloughs so they could go home, not just visit their families, but cast a ballot. And there was a lot of talk about the loyal vote in 1864. And in fact, even after the Republicans had won the election, Salmon Chase still wanted McClellan investigated for what he saw as possible treason during the 1862 Peninsula Campaign, still after poor McClellan. Now obviously, the Republicans in 1864 had done what a lot of Confederates had done. They had exploited anti-party rhetoric for their own ends. And even as the North remained factious with a functioning political party system, with a factious Republican Party and a factious Democratic Party, certainly the Confederates, despite the absence of a political party system, had remained factious as well. In fact, in the end, I think it's fair to say that political opposition, something Americans at most times have highly valued, at least we value it in theory. I think we, I think we value political opposition when we're in the opposition, and not, you know, not when we're on the other side, but at least we claim to value political opposition. I think in the end, this political opposition proved to be decidedly a mixed blessing in Civil War America. Thank you very much.
two maternal great grandfathers uh, fought in a, a cavalry regiment called Fort Jordan Cavalry, which is made up of men from five or six counties around Chattanooga, some from Tennessee, mm -hmm. some from Georgia. And they were, uh, they, they fought for the Confederate mm -hmm. Army. Uh, one of them is supposedly buried in his Confederate uniform, mm -hmm. which is hard to believe because they yeah. never had uniforms. But, but, but uh, supposedly it was his uh, veterans organization's uniform. What, what was it that caused these, and they had very little in common with the plantation right. people further south. What was it that caused people in places like northwest Georgia to embrace the Confederate cause when they're People, the voted against the That's an excellent question, and I'm going to try to keep my answer as short as possible. But I'm, I may not, I may not succeed. We may be here till 7:30 by the time I finish. Uh, first of all, voting against secession can be interpreted in various ways. Some that vote against secession are simply voting for delay. These are the so-called cooperationists. Uh, and I think most of the people that oppose secession are not absolute unionists, your ancestors being a good example. They weren't, you know, they just thought secession was a bad idea at the time, but once Fort Sumter was fired on, once Lincoln called for troops, then the question became coercion. And so even though Georgia was deeply divided during the secession debates, in fact, you know, one wonders what would have happened had that vote in the secession convention in Georgia gone the other way. Would that have stopped the whole thing? Even though Georgia was deeply divided, there was great rallying uh, to the Confederate cause at the beginning of the war. You're, uh, you're, the second part, an even more complicated part of the question is, you know, what did these, what did these people fight for? And what, is often, what we've often done is we've conflated two different questions. We've, we've treated them as if they were one question and they're not one question. The questions are these. Why did the war come? Why did the war come? Well, the war comes because of growing sectional conflict and the question of slavery in the national territories and the election of a Republican president. Okay, that's the shorthand answer to that question. And I think it's a good one. But the other question is, why do people fight? You can ask that on the Union side and you can ask that on the Confederate side. And then you get a lot more answers, okay? You know, you're fighting for home, you're fighting for family, you're fighting for slavery, and non-slaveholders fought for slavery too because non-slaveholders believe, Joe, Joe Brown, Governor Joe Brown of Georgia was especially good at talking about this, he talked about the interests of the non-slaveholders in the institution of slavery, racial and economic. So, you know, if you ask why an individual soldier or a group of soldiers fought, the list becomes very long. And my cynical friend Bill Marvel claims that a lot of these guys fought because they needed a job. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you can, you can kind of take your pick. But I do want to emphasize that the question of secession and the origin of the war and the question of why people were fighting, those are two, those are two separate questions. So I didn't do, I didn't do too badly on that. Uh, yes, sir. What I don't understand is where did the fervor come from? It wasn't just the north between the north and the south. There was real fervor. There was, there was almost hatred from the north and the south. Mm. Uh, they, they, 45% casualties in many battles, and yet they fought on, they wouldn't give up. Um, you know, it's not just the war, there was passion in the war. Where did the passion come from? But I still haven't, I haven't seen it. Well, civil wars, of course, probably generate more passion than, than foreign wars. I, th I think, I think you, could, you could probably say that on a comparative basis. And it's sort of like a feud within a family. Some of the most intense conflicts you can imagine are within, are within families. And historians have long debated how different were Southerners from Northerners and what were the basis of those differences. And you can argue back and forth. I think you could actually make a case, and this is somewhat paradoxical, but all professors are good at talking out of both sides of their mouth. You could argue that both what they had in common and what separated them 
added to those passions that you're talking about. And, you know, that is the one thing that I think we don't do a very good job in history because it's so easy to look at history as this sort of bloodless, abstract sort of thing and not recognize that all of these people we are studying are they're like us. They had blood coursing through their veins. They had ambitions. They had dreams. They had passions. They had delusions. They had ideas. They had hatred. They had courage. They had cowardice. They had all of these, all of these human characteristics. And of course, once you start shooting, once you start shooting, your blood gets up. I mean, Robert E. Lee talked about this, you know, about you know, it is, it, it, it is, it is wonderful that it, it is good. I'm not going to get this quote exactly right. It is good that this is so terrible we should grow too fond of it. And here's Lee, this kind of aristocratic Episcopalian. Or um, I think the North, look at the way the North reacts to the firing on the flag at Fort Sumter. There were large numbers of Northerners in February and March who were saying, I'll let them go. Let those Southerners go, good riddance, that sort of thing. I found a preacher in doing my religious thing who preached this peace sermon right before Fort Sumter. Flags fired on, he preaches a war sermon the next Sunday. People's blood was up. Read George Templeton Strong's diary sometime about the excitement in New York City once the news of Sumter, you know, came in. And, and one of the things I just think is wonderful about studying Civil War history is, you know, you read what the people said and you read what they did and you, you kind of get at that passion and hatred. And, you know, maybe we don't have adequate explanations for it, but it's, it's there. It's there and you kill over 600,000 people. It's staggering bloodshed. Was Johnson's selection critical for the, you know, it's interesting, and I, I read something new on that recently. Um, Apparently Hannibal Hamlin, Lincoln's first vice president, there's a good final Jeopardy question that would probably, <laughs> that would probably stump most people, and maybe even the computer, I don't know. Uh, uh, Hannibal Hamlin, I think, thought he was going to be renominated. Uh, there's not much evidence that Lincoln ever said much to Hannibal Hamlin about anything, but then that was the, I mean, vice presidents were not entities in the 19th century. They truly were. They had but one function. Um, and it's not even clear among historians whether it was Lincoln that engineered Johnson's nomination or not. Um, it's either Hay or Nicolay, one of Lincoln's secretaries, was actually at the convention and kind of reports back on this. And I can't imagine that Lincoln didn't have some say in it. The idea was you would, you would nominate a war Democrat from a border state, and of course Johnson, let's not forget, Johnson had been a hero in the North. Why? He was the only senator from a seceding state who had remained loyal to the Union. And he had defied Confederate mobs, and he talked about Southern traitors, and of course during the war he talks about hanging Southern traitors. I mean, and, and the radical Republicans thought Johnson was their man. And so Johnson seems to bring strength to the ticket. He, he, the radicals like him. He'll draw Democratic votes. When, Link, when Lincoln is assassinated, one of the radical Republican senators even says, Johnson, by the gods, we won't have trouble now. We'll have a harsh Reconstruction policy. They, they were obviously you know, badly mistaken. But yeah, that, that's an interesting example of, you know, you have sort of politics as normal, the selection of a vice presidential candidate, but then the war intrudes as well. Is there time for one more? Yes. Yes. Do you think that the divisiveness within the Democratic uh, Party as a 
It helped. I mean, you know, in, in Civil War history, people always ask what if questions. What if Stonewall Jackson had been alive for Gettysburg and stuff like that? A what if, I, I like, I, you know, historians don't like to answer what if questions and we always say, well, I don't do hypotheticals and all that, but, you know, we're sort of like football fans. We like to think what if, uh, you know, what if the Confederates had not fired on Fort Sumter? Would Lincoln have been in a pickle and that sort of thing? Uh, what if the Democrats in 1864 had nominated McClellan but not on a peace platform. And of course, Lincoln himself thought in the summer of 64, with the war stalemated still, that he was not going to be reelected. He wrote this famous blind memorandum and had the cabinet sign it, saying, you know, if, if this administration is not elected, we're going to have to, you know, do something between the election and the inauguration to make sure the Union is somehow preserved. And you might argue that General Sherman wins the election for Abraham Lincoln by, by taking Atlanta. But, you know, the, the, the Democrats, the Democrats could have fine, perhaps could have finessed their differences and would have made McClellan a much stronger candidate because it's striking. It's striking. Once that nomination is made and once that platform is adopted, Soldiers who had been McClellan loyalists from the beginning say no. You know, he's fallen into the hands of traitors. You might as well nominate the notorious copperhead Clement Blandingham as, as McClellan on that peace platform. And it takes McClellan several weeks to react. In those days, presidential candidates did not attend the national conventions. They weren't even supposed to openly seek the office. That's sort of a refreshing thought, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so McClellan has to write a letter accepting the nomination. And he stewed about this and stewed about this, and in McClellan's papers there are several drafts of this letter. You know, and finally he accepts the nomination but doesn't accept the platform. But by then it, it didn't matter. And, you know, they didn't have polling in those days, but I think that I think the Republicans and Lincoln thought they were, they were pretty well home free by, by the early fall, particularly with Atlanta and good news in the Shenandoah Valley and all that kind of stuff. Well, thank you very much. Enjoyed it.